to serve and protect is the marketing slogan of police officers and police agencies around the country. But is it really true? The answer is legally, no, not really, because police and government have no duty to protect your lives absent a special circumstance or a special relationship, which rarely occurs. Bottom line is to serve and protect is a marketing slogan and not a legal duty, which means you are your own first responder. We'll talk about the law in just one second. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Boxes, diner, best-selling author, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and proud American gun owner. If you haven't subscribed to The Four Boxes, diner, Second Amendment channel here on YouTube, or follow me on Twitter, yes, I'm on Twitter now, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms. This is a hot topic. Most of you know the answer to this, but I want to make it very clear that police and the government have no legal duty to protect your life absent an extremely set of narrow circumstances which rarely arise. I just want to also give you the law for this so you have it off the tip of your tongue because yes, I do want you, as I've always said, to be the smartest person in the room when it comes to the Second Amendment so you can have the facts that you need to win for our team wherever you happen to be. To begin, I've often said you are your own first responder. Why is that? Because you, the American citizen, are the first person to see the criminal, the sick person, or the fire. So you have to deal with it first. Now that may be shooting the bad guy. It may be scaring off the bad guy or fighting the bad guy. It may be calling 911 to get the fire department there to put out the fire. It may be doing CPR on the sick person. Whatever it is, you deal with the problem first, you react to it first, which makes you the first responder. Not government, not the fire department, not the police department, not the EMTs. They are second or maybe third responders at best. Never lose sight of this. But what about the law? And what about all these people that say, hey, you don't need guns, trust government. They'll protect you. Well, we know that's not true, just practically speaking, because we saw what happened down at Uvalde, Texas, where you had over 300 law enforcement officers showed up at Uvalde, Texas' uh, elementary school and uh, took over an hour before they confronted the bad guy and killed him. So we know that the case, and this is repeatedly the case. We know the, you know, the police uh, officers at uh, Pulse nightclub in F Florida sat outside for three hours before they uh, entered the building, although there was a initial shots. That wasn't by the SWAT team. So the bottom line is we know there's countless examples of this where the government doesn't protect us. But that's a practical argument. What about the law? Does government even have an obligation to protect you? The answer is no, they don't. No, they don't. So I'm going to give you three cases. One major case out of the District of Columbia, which is a big historical case that summarizes this principle, and two U.S. Supreme Court cases that show that the, neither the police nor the government have a duty to protect our lives as a general matter. To begin, the two United States Supreme Court cases that state that neither government nor police have a legal duty to protect our lives as a general matter is the case of Deshawnee versus Winnebago County, that's from 1989. We'll talk about the facts of that in just one second. They're terrible, but they illustrate the point. And then, of course, there's the town of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez from 2005, also by the U.S. Supreme Court, which, again, another set of terrible facts. But again, the Supreme Court concludes no legal duty to protect us by the government. I want to begin this with talking about the case of Warren versus the District of Columbia, which is in the Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia. Again, the District of Columbia is very important often historically for talking about our relationship with the government because there's so much government and activity in the District of Columbia, you get a lot of really important precedent-setting rules that many other courts across America follow. That was the case of this case called Warren versus the District of Columbia from 1981. Yes, it's a while back, but it became kind of like the basic rule of what I'm about to talk about, which is that neither police nor government have a legal duty to protect you. First of all, how do you enforce a legal duty? The answer is, if someone owes you a legal duty and then they fail to uphold that duty, they fail to satisfy that duty, you 
can sue them in civil court for money damages. So if a, a doctor has a duty to protect your life or to keep you alive and not act negligently and that doctor fails to do so, uh, you can sue the doctor for damages associated for their failure to perform uh, their duty to you to give you adequate health care, for example. Okay, many examples of this. We don't need to go through all of them. But in 1981, there was a lawsuit brought by several plaintiffs that were terrible victims of terrible crimes, and they sued the District of Columbia saying that the police failed to adequately protect them. They screwed up, and these people were severely uh, injured in terrible crimes, and they sued the District of Columbia. In that case, the D.C. Court of Appeals said that there's no duty to protect Americans by government. The government has no duty whatsoever to protect you absent what's known as a special relationship, which usually, by the way, only comes up in two contexts. One is they are arrest you and stick you in prison, at which point they have to take care of you because that you can't take care of yourself. They've basically taken you into custody and now you've become a dependent upon the government. And in that instance, they do have a duty to protect you because there's a special relationship because again, they've taken over your freedom and they've taken over your body, they've taken over your life, and therefore they owe you a duty to protect you if you're in their custody. And the other one, sometimes it pops up in the context of maybe a confidential uh, informant or something like that. But bottom line is, for ordinary people, forget about it. You've got no protection uh, from the government. They have no duty to protect you, nor do the police. So here's a couple of the key quotes from the District of Columbia's Court of Appeals in 1981, which again has become kind of the law of the land, if you will. So here's what the court said. The duty to provide public services is owed to the public at large. And absent a special relationship, between the police and an individual, no specific legal duty exists. No specific legal duty exists, which means, yeah, the government has some sort of theoretical general obligation to protect America, has a duty to protect citizens, but the reality is if they fail to do so, you have no recourse. So it's only like a Soviet constitutional right. It says it on, on in paper, but it really has no practical meaning whatsoever. So again, um, all across America, no duty to protect. What the, what the court also said was the District of Columbia appears to follow the well-established rule, the well-established rule that official police personnel and the government employing them are not generally liable to victims of criminal acts for failure to provide adequate police protection. Let me read this again. This is a federal court, a court of appeals, huge court. The District of Columbia appears to follow the well-established rule, and this is back in 1981, it's only become more well-established well since then, I'll tell you why in a second, that official police personnel and the government employing them are not generally liable to victims of criminal acts for failure to provide adequate police protection. That's the rule in 1981, and again, it's only expanded. The duty of government has actually continued to shrink, if anything. Beyond that, this is what they say, and this is crazy. This is what it says. It's true. The Court of Appeals in D.C. in 1981 says courts have, without exception, let me let me say that one more time. Courts have, without exception, concluded that when a municipality or other governmental entity undertakes to furnish police services, it assumes a duty only to the public at large and not to individual members of the community. Now, of course, again, what they're really saying is, yeah, we have a general duty to protect you. We, we mouth the words. We say it. We pretend it. We paint it on our cars. But we don't really mean it. And the reason why we know you don't mean it is because no way to sue them. Again, here's a basic rule. You have no rights if you have no remedy. What that means is if they fail in their job, their general duty to protect you, there's nothing you can do about it, which means you really have no rights because if you don't have a remedy to enforce your rights, you have no rights. Again, no rights without a remedy. Since you have no remedy to sue the police and get money from them, you have no rights. So this general duty they talk about is, again, it's a marketing slogan at best. And that's what the Warren versus the District of Columbia case in 1981 set the precedent for. And it was really just summarizing the understanding of American law up to that point. But it gets worse for the American public. I'll tell you why in just one second. 
The next case I want to talk about is a United States Supreme Court case called Deshani versus Winnebago County. Again, 1989, United States Supreme Court, the highest court in the, of the land, of course. What happened here was a terrible story, but in, the basic facts gave rise to the ultimate conclusion, which we all know, and I want you to repeat after me, the government and the police, both, the police and the government have no duty to protect us from criminals absent basically being in prison. If we're not in prison, if we're not in their custody, they generally have no duty whatsoever to protect us from criminal predators and if we get hurt uh, by virtue of a violent crime or other kind. They have no duty to protect us as a matter of law. Okay, so here's what happened in the Deshani case in 1989. Terrible story. You had a one-year-old infant that was in the custody of a father. There had been a lot of evidence that this father was abusive to the one-year-old infant. In fact, it was so, so kind of understood that a social worker from the county was actually assigned to this case. And the social worker actually started documenting and writing that the father that was over, you know, that was babysitting and was in custody of the one-year-old infant had been abusing the infant. Well, despite this documentation, the county never did anything to protect that infant from the father. And to make a long story short, the father one day apparently really abused the kid and violently abused the kid to the point where the kid was knocked into some sort of terrible coma and became brain dead or at least severely brain injured to the point where he was no longer able to really function and as he grew up, going into his 30s, he was just not functioning as a, as a human being in any real sense, is my understanding, uh, because of this terrible brain damage that he suffered because his father beat him up when he was like one years of age. And a terrible story, uh, this one-year-old infant eventually grew up and I think died in his mid-30s from the trauma that he suffered as an infant at the hands of this terrible father. But the point being that the mother sued the government saying, you were assigned to protect my child. You actually knew the father was abusing my child. And how do we know that you knew? Because you were writing it down. And what did you do, government, in Wisconsin? Nothing. You never protected my child from the predations and evilness and abuse of his father. And the, now, now he's like was severely brain damaged and ultimately, of course, passed away in his mid-30s because of this damage done by the abusive father. And you, government, did nothing. And what did the U.S. Supreme Court, when they heard this case, said? Sorry, terrible set of facts. We agree. But under the law, there is no legal duty that government owes to protect anyone as a general matter, even in these facts where the government knew that the abuse was taking place. The government was assigned to protect this child as part of protective services and was aware of what the father was doing. And still, under this U.S. Supreme Court precedent of the Shawnee versus Winnebago, no duty, no liability on the part of the government to protect the ch child, no damages, no ability to sue. The case against the government was dismissed. Deshani versus Winnebago County, I'll put the citation down below so you have it at your fingertips. That was a decision by none other, none other than the United States Supreme Court, the highest court of the land. The last case I want to talk about is another United States Supreme Court case. Again, I'm only giving you these three cases because I just think this is all you need to know to have at your fingertips to, to, to substantiate the fact that everyone understands that the government has no duty to protect your life from criminals, nor do the police. This is the case called Town of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez in 2005, a U.S. Supreme Court case dealing with another terrible set of facts. These cases always deal with terrible facts. And I think the courts, you know, use these cases with terrible facts to say, even in the worst case scenario, neither the government nor police have a legal duty to protect you and you can't sue them or get any redress against them. They don't protect you, suffer too damn bad, basically is what they're saying. So here's what happens in the town of Castle Rock. You had a court ordered permanent restraining order that said that the father, the estranged father, was not allowed to get near the mother or the three daughters. 
uh, which is the family, right? The family unit at the time that had broken up in a divorce proceeding, permanent restraining order, apparently. So what happened here was that the father kidnapped, uh, captured, took into cut, whatever you want to say. The father took the three daughters with him in violation of the permanent restraining order that says he wasn't allowed to be near the daughters. And basically, to make a long story short, he killed the three daughters and wound up getting killed by the police in a shootout at the local police station. So he's killed. After they kill him, they open up the trunk of the car he was driving and they find the bodies of the three dead daughters. Okay, the mother sues the government saying that you failed to protect me and my daughters from the psycho father because he violated this restraining order and therefore you owe me damages. And the Supreme Court said yet again, nope, no you don't. That's not how it works. No legal duty by the government or the police to protect you from crime as a general matter. Therefore, any lawsuit that you bring against the town of Castle Rock for any kind of argument that they violate their duty to protect you cannot fly because there's no legal duty on the part of government or police to protect you from criminals, including your estranged husband that uh, was killed in a shootout and killed your three daughters in violation of the order, uh, the permanent restraining order. Uh, just sorry, terrible situation, but legally you have no recourse against the government or the police. That's just the way it is. Okay, so these are three examples of cases I've given you. There's many more, but I think two Supreme Court cases and the Warren case, if you have these, I'll put the citations down below so you have them. You can cut and paste them. You can put them in other comments and other blogs, whatever you do uh, with these. That's perfectly fine. Again, the fundamental point is neither the government or police have a duty to protect us. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean that the government cannot choose to pay off someone. And if the government, and this often happens, we probably should do a video about this. If the government feels it wants to uh, pay someone money, nothing really can stop it. Uh, as to how this comes about in various circumstances, we can discuss this. But from your point of view, you need to make an assumption that the government will not be protecting your life because they have no duty. Again, the phrase to serve and protect is a marketing slogan. It is not a legal duty. You cannot count on this, which means at the end of the day, if you want to protect yourself against criminals and criminality, it is your job to do so. Do not count on anyone else, especially the government or the police to do so, because the reality is, practically speaking, they probably will not be able to accomplish the job, even if they try to do it. And moreover, if they fail to do it, there's no recourse to them. There's no downside to them at the end of the day. Okay, I hope you learned a little bit something here today at the Four Boxes Diner. If you haven't subscribed, please do so, and we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up. Table 2A.